Good day, everyone. My name is uh, Paul Buitink, and welcome to a very special edition of our monetary talk show. My co-host is Spanish Luis Espinosa Godet. He's calling in from Quito. Hi, uh, Luis. Hi, Paul. And uh, where Luis teaches as a professor at the Universidad San Francisco. He's a big proponent of keeping the U.S. dollar as money in Ecuador. And together with Luis, I'd like to extend a big welcome to our guest today. It's Professor Steve Henke, economist at Johns Hopkins University and director of the Troubled Currencies Project at Cato Institute and a decades-long currency reformer. And, um, professor, welcome in the show. Good to be with you, Paul. And, and of course, with Luis, too. Yeah, you guys have met so, in, uh, in, in Ecuador uh, a few times, right? Luis, could you tell us a bit more about um, uh, what your connection is? Yeah, we are very thankful to Professor Hanke. We also give an honoris causa in our, my university because he's one of the few people outside Ecuador the dollarization in the year to There were so many people, he could say, cite some of them also in the International Monetary Fund that were against the dollarization. And we are very thankful because uh, Steve played a good role defending dollarization in those difficult years. Okay, great. Well, um, Professor, uh, maybe it's good for the um, audience, to, for the part of the audience that um, haven't heard of you before. Could you uh, share with us um, some of your highlights as uh, in all those decades as a currency reform? Well, I, I'd be happy to do that, Paul. I think be, before I mention anything, the, the reason that I, I became very interested in, in currency reform is that if, if you look at the, the, the world, and you ha have the world out there with all these central banks producing domestic currency, you have to ask, well, are these monetary arrangements with central banks wise? Because typically they produce one thing that's very bad, inflation. They have high, uh, produce high and variable inflation rates, so that's bad. And, and, and associated with the high and variable inflation rates, you, you have highly variable and, and relatively low rates of inflation when you compare central banking countries to comparable countries that have other monetary arrangements like dollarization, uh, you using some foreign currency, or, or like a currency board system that, uh, that, that is essentially cloning a anchor currency with a, uh, a, 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 a domestic currency. So, so if, you, if you look at what's good and what's bad, my conclusion was central banking was bad. It was producing a lot of inflation and slow growth, and that these other arrangements, either cloning an anchor currency with a currency board or adopting fully a foreign currency like, like the U.S. dollar or euro the, the, or, or the Swiss franc. In the case of Liechtenstein, of course, they use the Swiss franc. So, so that's how I got into the, 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 the game shall we say, and, and the game really started in earnest in 1989 in Argentina. Uh, I was working with a, a group in the, in the Congress there, uh, and, and I did this after meeting in 1989, the first time with President Menem, and I worked with this so-called al Sagarai faction within the Congress and came up with a a proposal, uh, Dr. Kurt Schuler and I co-authored a, a, a book in Spanish that proposed an orthodox currency board for Argentina. Well, in April of 1991, actually Argentina adopted something similar to, but not really the real thing, and that is something they call convertibility. And the problem with convertibility, they put this in in April of April 1, actually, of 1991, and the, the problem with the convertibility law, there were a lot of loopholes in the law, a lot of things that really allowed for the central bank to engage in discretionary monetary policy, and in September, or maybe August of 1991, I wrote a, a piece in the Wall Street Journal saying that eventually the thing would blow up because the central bank would engage in discretionary monetary policy. 
Well, it lasted 10 years, uh, the best 10 years performance they've had in, in mm -hmm. contemporary history in Argentina with convertibility, but it did blow up, mm -hmm. and they, it was abandoned in 2002. Along the way, I, I was 1989, really through 1999, advising President Menem uh, informally, uh, formally advising uh, the Minister of Finance, Domingo Cavallo, in 1995. And so that was the first experience. Quickly going through other ones, uh, in 1992, Estonia had the Russian ruble, and the Russian ruble was inflating. Estonia was independent then. They, they, they weren't part of the Soviet Union, but they, their currency was the ruble, and it, it was inflating. They were desperate to get rid of that, and I wrote a book with uh, Professor Lars Yoning and Dr. Schuler, in which we proposed an Orthodox Currency Board. I went there in May of 1992 and proposed this to the uh, uh, government, and they in installed in June of 1992, a currency board. It worked like a charm. Right. So, you've been, so, for, so for decades, you've been advising all sorts of governments. Uh, yeah, we could get, we, we, uh, then it was Lithuania Currency Board in 1994, Bos Bosnia Herzegovina in 1997, Bulgaria was a famous case where we put in a currency board in, in July of 1997. And, and they had really a hyperinflation in Bulgaria. The monthly inflation rate in February of 1997 was 142%. So that we, in July, when we put in the currency board, uh, inflation stopped immediately. And, and within 30 days, interest rates were down in single digits. And uh, the, as they say, the rest is history. So. Mm -hmm. So that, that's, the, that's the experience. We, the, all, all of these cases did what? They stopped inflation with the currency board and stimulated economic growth. Now, the dollarization comes in a little later. The first dollarization I actually did, I, I was part of the government in Montenegro in 1999, and we adopted the Deutschmark. Montenegro was still part of the rump Yugoslavia then, but they, they got rid of the Yugoslav dinar and replaced it with the Deutschmark. It, it, it worked perfectly. And then we had 2000 uh, in, in Ecuador. Ecuador got rid of the Sucre and replaced it with the U.S. dollar. Inflation, of course, fell right away and economic growth. And, and performance has been very good in Ecuador even though the current government has has a very very much of the Chavez type of economic socialist model, so so dollar the dollar the, the, the key thing with dollarization it, it provides discipline. Now, now the president in Ecuador, uh, Correa, is always complaining about the straight so-called straight jacket. You see that dollarization yeah, yeah, yeah. puts on him. Every day he's complaining and arguing that this is this is terrible, but if you have a government or governments and weak institutions like they have in Ecuador, you you want to put a straitjacket on those in government that are responsible because if you don't have a straitjacket, you're going to have unstable money, a lot of inflation, and slow economic growth. So a straitjacket is exactly what you want. Yeah, like a gold standard in a way, huh? like like a modern gold standard for for yeah. Ecuador in this case. Yes, uh, and, and, and 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 the only difference is the convertibility of the. And if you have a currency board, the convertibility is back into the U.S. dollar. In the case of Ecuador, of course, there isn't any convertibility. They're using the dollar outright, so that's their money. But what about um, for if, if, a, if a bank in Ecuador extends credit, he creates um, a loan, he also creates a deposit, uh, but that is not a real dollar then. It's like a claim to a, to a dollar when, when people go to the ATM and they get money from their bank, they're converting a dollar claim into a dollar. Basically, or what's what's going? No, the, the unit, no, the unit of the unit of account in in terms of the loans. If the unit of account and the loans are made in dollars, which they are in Ecuador, that that's the, not a problem. You're you're creating broad money, bank money, but but the, the high-powered money, the the state money, 
is not produced by the central bank in Ecuador. It's it's produced by the the, the Federal Reserve, and of course the 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 determination of how much high-powered money is in Ecuador is a function of the balance of payments. I mean that. that yeah. But, but but what you were talking about, Paul, is is very important because the bank money, in fact, is the most important part of the money supply in in, in terms of the absolute amount. Broad money is is produced by banks. In other words, M1, M2, M3, M4, whatever the M number. The the thing that's produced by central banks is M sub zero, high powered money, and 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 the high powered money in in Ecuador is the U.S. dollar, and the magnitude of the high powered money circulating is a function of the balance of payments in Ecuador. So in a dollarized economy like uh, like Ecuador, when a banks when a bank gets into trouble, um, what kind of facilities can a bank use then? Because in an, any other sovereign currency issuing country, the the commercial bank can get a loan or can, or can get reserves from the central bank. How does it work? Well, it, 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 the, the, the best example is Panama. Now, Panama has been dollarized for over a century, and, and their banking system is very integrated into the international uh, uh, banking system and international capital markets. So, to answer your question, the, 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 they they never have a liquidity problem because because Panama is like a little tiny pool in the international capital market compared to the huge ocean of of capital and liquidity and credit that are that are outstanding in U.S. dollars. So if if a, if 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 banks have a liquidity problem, not not a solvency problem, if they have a liquidity problem, this is not an issue in Panama. Panama does not need a lender of last resort because they just use the wholesale international markets to get liquidity. The if they need liquidity in Panama, the interest rate in Panama on a risk-adjusted basis will go up, and and it just sucks liquidity into Panama. Then, so they they don't need a they don't need a central bank. The problem with Ecuador e Ecuador has a problem because their their banking system is not integrated. Well, with the international system, and that's this is my idea. That's the Louise can, can talk about this. I can see he's an anxious and yeah, raring to go. Sure. But but the, the 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 system of banks and bank regulation and bank integration is un underdeveloped, very underdeveloped in Ecuador, and this is a problem. And the laws are a problem in Ecuador. It it is not like Panama, where Panama doesn't need a lender of last resort. They're using the capital markets, a free market. The, 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 it's it's potentially a, a problem in, in, in Ecuador. May I add that I thought we thought in the year 2000 that with dollarization the economy will be more open to the world. It didn't happen. But the dollarization had working as a proxy or almost a free banking system without a central bank being a last resource. And it worked so well. The Ecuadorian uh, financial system is sold and used to be sold before Korea much better. It used to be sold, and it's because the bankers had done their work very well because they didn't know that there is no moral hazard. They didn't. They they did know that there was not a last resource lender. Right. Yeah, that's that's. So, do you agree with that, uh, Professor? That it's it's kind of uh, there is sort of a free banking environment now in in Ecuador because of the lack of a lender of last resort. Uh, I, I wouldn't. I, I think that's a stretch uh, to characterize it that way. I, I, the 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 fact is that the financial sector in Ecuador is tiny. It's only that, that includes banks, insurance companies, brokerages and so forth. It only accounts for about two point nine percent of GDP. So the financial sector is, is very shall we say underdeveloped and and and, and somewhat backward in, in in Ecuador. There's a lot of potential there simply because like Panama, it is dollarized, but the the Ecuadorian laws have not encouraged, shall we say, a 
more robust development of the financial sector. But it, it would be easy to do because, it, because the country is dollarized. Right. Hi, to the ID. Yeah, in 2003, you wrote a paper, a Professor, about um, the necessity of having rule of law um, in order to uh, to become a sovereign currency issuer. So if you don't have the rule of law, then um, the people shouldn't trust it, their own government with the issuance of currency. So when when would Ecuador be ready, in your view, to have a um, sovereign currency again? Oh, I, I, I think it is, is, as far as the eye could see, they should be using the U.S. dollar. Vir virtually all emerging market countries should be using the U.S. dollar, or may maybe the euro, but the, the dollar is the king. It, it's, it's involved as a vehicle currency in 90% of all the trade transactions. It's, it's about 65% of all foreign reserves. It's, it's, it's used... Even the U.S. currency, about two-thirds of all of the U.S. dollar paper money, the notes that are outstanding, are, are circulating overseas. But is it, healthy, is it healthy for the world economy as a whole um, to have so much uh, dominance in one currency to give to, to grant that kind of power to the states? It, 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 well, it isn't granting any power to anybody. It, it, people freely choose to use it. <laughs> Yeah, but people prefer to choose to use another currency. In other words, the, 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 these are a little bit theoretical arguments. The, 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 the reveal preference in the world market is people prefer the dollar. For, for the over 2,000 years, there's always been one dominant currency in the world. And it happens that it's the dollar right now. And so any, any, any country that can't keep inflation under control and can't sustain economic growth is, is foolish not to, to have legal tender status for the U.S. dollar. And my, my we add, uh, Go ahead. Yeah, my, my, my we address this issue of sovereignty because it's this 19th century concept of the sovereignty of the nation and we should have our own money and what it that really means in the year 21st century and what's this idea of national currencies? Can you address it? I, I, see, I think it's so old. It's... And, and, and the way things work, it, it, it's, it's odd because, for example, if you, if you look at trade, if you look at trade between Britain and Germany and and, and the, the British have the pound sterling and the, and the Germans have the euro now. But, but uh, almost 40% of, of all the exports that, that go out of Britain to Germany are, are invoiced and priced in dollars, not, not sterling and euros. And that's, they're free to do that. So, so what, how, can you, how can you complain about it? I, I, the the dollar might not be a perfect currency, but it but it is it, it is the dominant and and uh, most important currency in the world by far. All, all the other currencies are are very very minor players. The the euro is a, is a big regional currency, but it's a it's a relatively small uh, thing. The, the Japanese yen is is a, is hardly a regional currency. It's just a big national currency. The Chinese are are trying to make a move, and and the Chinese might be successful because the the U.S. You, you you have to ask the question. Well, what what could knock the dollar off the top of the mountain? And and the U.S. could do that in one of two ways. Either either we could have bad monetary policy, and 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 then we'd have challengers threatening the dollar and, and, and taking over dollar space. This is what happened to the pound sterling after the First World War. Pound sterling was the, was the dominant. It was the top of the mountain. Well, the, the U.S. was able to challenge it because monetary policy became a, a mess in, in the United Kingdom and, and, and sterling got knocked off the top. What do you think of current, current U.S. policy? Then? If you look at the current monetary policy of the Fed, do you think it's sound or not? Because well, it, it, it's, <laughs> it's, a second, it's a second best uh, policy. If you're alluding to uh, quantitative easing, uh, the, what happened, and this is why I say it's, it's the second best policy, but it's, it's fine, 
And uh, it, here's what happened. After Lehman collapsed in 2008, we had a situation where it, all the politicians in Washington, D.C., as, as well as internationally, wanted to regulate banks more, regulate banks, beat up on banks. We passed something called the Dodd-Frank legislation, which is a, a huge piece of legislation regulating banks. And all of this put a, put a crimp. It, it, it basically imposed very tight monetary policy on banks that at that time were producing about 90% of broad money in the United States. 90% was for bank money produced by banks. And so all these regulations and laws and changes that were made after Lehman were in effect imposing tight, very tight monetary policy on the United States. And in fact, even today, the bank money level in the United States is slightly less than it was in 2008 when Lehman went down. So the question is, what's the central bank do? The central bank, they have no choice. To keep the broad money growing, they, they have to engage in quantitative easing. Other, otherwise, the U.S. economy would have gone into a great recession. Imploded, yeah. It would have totally imploded. And, and now, this is where people get confused. Many people said, well, quantitative easing and the huge expansion of the balance sheet of the central bank of the Federal Reserve will cause hyperinflation, they said, a lot of inflation. Well, this is just incorrect analysis because inflation is caused by what? By rapid growth in broad money, I prefer the, the divisia measure, M4, which is provided to us with the, by the Center for Financial Stability in New York, that number. And, and this, this measure, this metric for the money supply hasn't been growing very fast and, until very recently. But throughout all of the post-Lehman period when quantitative easing was underway, Divisia M4 was growing at less than 3% per year. So there's no way you're going to have hyperinflation or, or much inflation at all. Yeah. And, and, and that's where people were, were got everything wrong. All, all the gold bugs and so forth uh, completely have the incorrect analysis of quantitative easing. They, they don't understand money and banking and, and how the system works. Yeah. And, and it, but, if, but if you're like a straitjacket, wouldn't you then uh, prefer having the gold standard instead of dollarization in, for example, Ecuador? So they, they, because now you're still depending on good monetary policy in the states. So if the states, for some reason, uh, screw up their monetary policy, then a country like Ecuador would, benefit, would suffer from the consequences. Well, I, 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 the, the, I think th this is going to take us off into a, 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 a long session. You know, you'll be up all night okay. in Amsterdam. You'll fall asleep by the time we get done with the thing. I mean, we, 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 we can alternative, alternative currency regimes then. And we start tar talking about the gold standard. And then, and then we start talking about, well, what gold standard? Because there are many yeah. kinds of gold standards. Okay, and maybe, then, maybe and, next episode. Maybe next episode. And, and, so, yeah, then, and, and then we could also talk about, about competitive currency regimes. And then, and then we could also talk about free banking. I think the best thing to do, Paul, is, is, is in a realistic way talk about what, what's, what's on the plate right now and what, what are we looking at in the world right now. Yeah. And, and particularly... I don't particularly want to talk about the gold standard because the, because the gold bugs, the people who, who talk about the gold standard, don't even understand the current system we have right now. They've been predicting hyperinflation, which is absolutely ridiculous. The, yeah. the, the broad money would have to be growing at very rapid rates to have hyperinflation. And, and, and broad money has been growing since Lehman until the last two or three months broad money has been growing at less than 3% per annum, meaning that, that the nominal GDP in the United States could not grow much more than 3% in nominal terms, which is com composed of both real growth and, and, and inflation. And of course, that, 
what what this means is we're seeing very low inflation in the United States and also pretty low real growth in the United States mainly because broad money is not growing very fast and it's not growing very fast because the elephant in the room is bank money and bank money has actually contracted a little bit since Lehman in 2008 and and the only reason broad money is growing at all is that we've had this massive quantitative easing by the Federal Reserve. So as a result, the proportion of broad money made up of state money, that's the Federal Reserve money, has gone from a little under 10 percent of total M4 to, to about 20 percent of M4. So right. it's made up quite a bit of difference, but not yeah. much. Well, let's, let's go back to Ecuador. Maybe, Luis, um, you are very much in favor of keeping uh, the dollar, and you've actually uh, started an initiative with other local economists to, to start a public debate about it and to show support for the dollar. Could you elaborate on that a little, uh, on that a little bit? Yeah, we are very thankful because uh, Steve Hanke also joined us in this Foro Pro Dolarización in Spanish, and we are explaining to the Ecuadorians what dollarization really means, especially to economists. And I would like to, because uh, the current president, Correa, is uh, against the dollarization. He has said it once and again, and he's doing so many things in order to revert somehow the dollarization. And some economists, we are here to stand by the dollarization. But I would like to ask Steve about this, because for me it's quite astonishing that we have this evidence 20 years now in some countries, 15 in Ecuador, and really mo uh, countries with a strong money, especially poor countries with a strong money or a strong money, are working much better than other countries with a not so money. And we are st still having the same debate we had 20 years ago. How do you feel about that? Do you feel that the economy profession had changed somehow? And do they accept dollarization any better than they used to? Well, I, I think a, a couple of points. One, one thing that, that uh, Paul uh, Luis and, and his colleagues in Ecuador have been doing a very good job of, of informing the public about dollarization. And the public it, it is, not, uh, is not as stupid as the politicians think because, for example, President Correa was just on TV yesterday uh, uh, complaining about this straitjacket of dollarization. But, but at the bottom of the report, at the bottom of the report, and, th and this was coming from the left-wing state television, at the bottom of the report it says, but the president doesn't like the straitjacket, but 85% of the public loves the straitjacket, you see. Now that, that's, that's because the, the, the information and educational campaign that, that Luis and his colleagues have done in Ecuador. So the president doesn't like it, but he's never going to politically get rid of it because if you have 85% of the population saying they don't want to get rid of something, any politician who would get rid of something that popular, it would be a suicide mission. Yeah, I lived in Ecuador for two years, and that's where I met Luis, and, and everyone I talked to was always very much in favor of keeping the dollar. But uh, Luis, where, where does the uh, president think he, he will find the support? Is it maybe the indigenous communities, or is it where, amongst, his, amongst his supporters? Where can he find support for um, getting really rid of the interesting. The poor people, they are really in favor of legislation because it's the first time in their lives that they can have savings. And they are so thankful for the dollar because they can save their, their money. It's the educated people that read these uh, economic books that they say that devaluation is good for export and so on. It's the educated people, but bad educated, bad economics who are against dollarization. For example, the president of Korea. And I'm probably surprised about that. The people that feel it, that live it, they are in favor. The people that study it, they are against. Yeah, and what about the people in the north, close to Colombia? There, the companies, uh, um, they seem to suffer a bit from, or at least they say they suffer a bit from um, the, the fact that uh, Ecuador is much more expensive now compared to Colombia and that devaluated the currency in, uh, over time. Yeah, but the, it happens in every country in the world. In the borders, there are people beneficiating against 
this kind of things. And in this case, in the border of Colombia, nowadays they are suffering, but for 15 years, the Colombians used to come to Ecuador to buy things much cheaper in Ecuador with the dollar that used to be in Colombia without the dollar. It happened for 15 years. So now they are complaining, but they are not very much in, in ration. Okay, well, I see the professor has uh, is is on mute. Uh, maybe he's um, he's had, he does have to do something else uh, briefly. Maybe Luis, before um, uh, we can possibly talk a little bit about Bitcoin now, before we talk about the new digital currency issued by um, the central bank, because I look forward to what the professor has to say about that. But if we talk about Bitcoin, is Bitcoin um, popular in Ecuador, or how is the adoption going? That that is that is really interesting because if you say see the countries in Latin America who are most in favor of Bitcoin are, without any doubt, Argentina and Venezuela, because their currencies are so bad. But in Ecuador, it's growing, a uh, Bitcoin movement, and it's growing because we are very scary about the, this new currency. If I might explain to our listeners, this new currency is the only central bank in the world that is creating their own electronic currency. Why? Because it's one of the few central banks in the world that they don't have their own uh, currency. Okay, yeah. Um, the professor is back. Can you hear us, professor? Um, you're on mute still, or we don't, we can't hear you. I see your lips moving. Oh, yes. Um, yeah, so continue explaining, uh, Luis, maybe what's, what this new currency. So it's the, the central bank in Ecuador issues uh, its own currency. This, this is quite, quite interesting. When we say that President Correa is trying to, 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 to move against dollarization, what they are creating is a new currency, which is parallel to the dollar, but it's an electronic currency managed by the central bank. And that is the problem because they are creating the currency that is managed by their central bank, so it could become a real currency, and it could become a real national currency, even if it is electronic. And how is it created? How does the process work? It, it, is, created, it is created just by the central bank. They, 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 they are looking to the Kenya or Paraguay models of electronic currency, but instead of doing it just of a payment system, they are doing as an electronic currency. And that's the huge difference. And I think it's quite interesting because Ecuador is behind all the other countries in Latin America in the use of electronic currency. And the central bank is pushing so hard in publicity, in the media, with the president, with the government, and they are not getting it. They are not doing it. The Ecuadorians using anything but dollars because they really do trust dollars. They don't trust central bank. And they say explicitly, I will not use this currency because I don't trust central bank. Yeah, uh, Professor, can you uh, hear us? Okay, well, he's, we can't hear him yet. Um, it must be his mic settings uh, on his machine. Um, but Luis, continue. So how, um, I'm still not sure how uh, unclear as to how it's created. Do you, as a, as a, as a citizen, I, um, have to deposit physical dollars, right? U.S. dollars in order to get the digital equivalent yeah. on my phone. Oh, 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 yeah, obviously nowadays it is 100% packets. So you have to go with your own dollars to the central bank, to the central bank, and deposit your your dollars in the central bank, and they issue this electronic currency. Yeah. But so what's the problem? Then? So it's like if it's backed 100%. What's the what's the problem? What's the perceived? Problem? The problem is, is that nowadays it's backed 100%. But who tell us in a few months it will not be back it? So they are creating new money. That is a problem. Yeah. Okay. So that's that's the fear. And um, and what about? Um, um, I, I also heard that the government is pushing for its use by, for example, allowing tax benefits if you start using this currency compared to the U.S. dollar. Can now, you nowadays, it, nowadays they have four percent of tax value that they are. Uh, giving you back if you pay with this currency. So it's a 4% uh, exchange rate. In fact, it's an exchange rate. So because with this new currency, you have 4% more of full session value. But it is not really working. Ecuadorians are not trusted anything in that. Okay. Well, one, uh, maybe one advice for Professor. Professor, you can also um, disconnect from the Hangout and come back in. If you, In case you hear me, you can just... Uh... 
go out and in again. Maybe that helps. But yeah, so um, okay, we'll see if he comes back with sound. Uh, it would be nice to have some closing remarks from the professor, of course. Uh, there he is. Yeah. Hello. Like yeah, that. we can hear you again. Yeah, it works. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. The, the, Hello, professor. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Luis, let, let me let me just add a couple. I was uh, completely agreeing with what you said, but the the point is that Luis says that people don't trust this electronic money because, in, in fact. The law allows for a fiat issue of the money. It doesn't have to be backed by 100%. The, the new law. They, they've had three different versions of the law. And the, and the new one, they, they clearly can issue fiat money. And, and the people don't trust that. So, so the tax rebate, it, it's, they're trying to subsidize. They have to subsidize people to get them to try to use it. Now, if they... They're just going to have to increase the subsidy to get them to use it because they, they don't they don't trust it. Now the other thing the, the thing that's bad about the electronic uh, money is that people don't trust the president and what he's doing with it, and and as a result they've taken deposits normal dollar deposits out of the central bank, and as a result deposits in the banking system have gone down which which means that there's there's a tightness and a credit squeeze in the economy and the credit squeeze in the economy I, I think the main factor driving that is people are afraid of what he's going to do with dollarization with this electronic money and so they're taking the greenbacks out of the bank and putting them under the mattress or, or in Miami yeah, yeah. And so you get a, a, a credit squeeze and a deflationary spiral in Ecuador. Yeah, so, so the argument the president used is that he was going to increase liquidity in the economy with this electronic money. They had a liquidity problem. No, he's done exactly the opposite. He's created a, 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 a liquidity crunch because, because he's playing around with the system. Yeah, that sounds very worrisome. Uh, is, is it still possible for the? Uh, are you still open for um, a consult? Can they um, hire you, uh, professor, and, um, and and give some advice on how to preserve uh, the dollar? Number one, number one, no, no one can hire me because all, all these currency reform activities, I always do them on a pro bono basis. That's one of my rules. So, so I, I, I'm not a consultant in that sense, but I, I've been a member of various governments and I've also been an advisor to various presidents and ministers of finance that have done these currency reforms but but uh, in, in the case of Ecuador it's 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 kind of interesting because you have a president who, who was against dollarization before it even be, was in, installed and he's always been against it rhetorically because he, he's, a, he's a socialist of a, of a certain Latin stripe, uh, Chavismo type of Venezuelan kind of orientation, shall we say. But he, he's much smarter than most people think. Most of his opponents don't realize that he's smarter than, than they think. And, and he, he can read the public opinion polls. And, and he, he's not going to get rid of dollarization. But, but he can play around with the thing at the edges. He can, he can rhetorically talk about it. Instead of making it work better than it already works, he, he, he has made it work less well than it really should. He should be behind it 100% because the performance of Ecuador relative to all of its neighbors in Latin America, with really the exception, I, I would say, Peru... Uh, Peru and Panama. Uh, th th those are the only two that are that have been better than Ecuador in in, in the last in the post Lehman period, and that's only because of dollarization. That's the that's the only thing g that that Ecuador has going for it. Of course, it had high oil, oil prices, thing. which yeah. helped. But the big thing is dollarization. Okay, well uh, that's very interesting, and thanks so much for your. Uh, for your uh, ideas and, and comments and, and knowledge, uh, Professor Luis, is there um, something else you'd like to to ask the professor?
Yes, one question just I have left is you have been fighting this fight, intellectual fight for 20 years. What do you think that economic profession, professional economists did change somehow about these kind of issues? Because I still hear these kind of things that devaluation is good for exports or the sovereign currency, and it doesn't seem too intellectual, too, too good for me. No. Did you see, the, the, did you see the, any change the, in the, the economic profession? The, the trouble with a profession is that they have trouble reading and understanding data, especially the, the more modern, uh, 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 shall we say, economists are even worse than the older ones. How, how can you have a, a post-Keynesian macroeconomic model that doesn't even include money and banking in the model? I mean, it, it does you know, none of this makes any sense. I mean, Keynes would never put up with most of this nonsense that's going on right now. So, I think the profession is is uh, in 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 bad shape, uh, incapable of even reading basic primary data and and drawing rather straightforward conclusions. If 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 you look at alternative monetary arrangements, and 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 you can show unambiguously that dollarization and currency board type of arrangements, for example, produce lower inflation rates and higher economic growth and more discipline and so forth over time than central banking. Uh, you, you pick dollarization or currency boards, not, not central banking. But what's, what's the profession pick? Central banks. So, so you tell me, Luis. So, I mean, they, they're just they 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 can't they can't come to a logical conclusion based on realistic data. But the, the, Jeff, I, I am a, a pro economics a professor of economics, and I have to in the economic books textbooks for the undergraduates, they still teach these kind of things, and there is no facts to back it. But they are still teaching these kind of things, and it's quite astonishing for me. Well, this is the, remember my 95% rule, Luis. 95% of what's written in the economics journals is either wrong or irrelevant. Now, Professor Armin Alchin gave, gave me that uh, a, a rule in, in 1967. Fortunately, I've I've lived with it all all, all those years, and and it's true. 95% of what's in the journals is either wrong or irrelevant. Yeah, and so I remember, I, I I remember another, another, another rule you have, uh, uh, professors, that you uh, have to listen to your wife, right? Well, that's numero uno. <laughs> I, I always, I always listen to a higher authority. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's good. Well, um, thanks um, so much, uh, professor. Is there something you'd like to add, or maybe ask us, or perhaps give some advice to uh, the Ecuadorians, Ecuadorians listening to this? Episode. No, I I I, th I think we've covered a, a lot of ground, and uh, I I have nothing to add except to thank you very much for inviting me, and and also uh, obviously, I'd like to uh, wish Luis continued success in his efforts to defend dollarization. Right, and where can uh, where can where can people find more in, uh, about you? What is the best way? Well, I, I think two ways. You can go to the Cato Institute uh, website, uh, or you can go to the Johns Hopkins Institute for Applied Economics, Global Health, and the Study of Business Enterprise. The, the Johns Hopkins Institute for Applied Economics, we, we have more material on currency boards and, and dollarization than, than any place in the world is, a, is on that site. Right. So if you want, if you want to find the papers and the data and so forth, that you go to that site. Okay, excellent. And and Louis, where can um, people find more about you and especially your initiative to uh, support dollarization? It is in Spanish. It's fordollarization.wordpress.com. You will find there, and also in the Universidad San Francisco de Quito, there I am. Right. Well, thanks, guys. Uh, have a great rest of the day, and uh, we look forward to doing it again in the future. Bye-bye.